over 50 areas that were required uh, for us to reform. That's a lot. It is. So what works and what has been working that is teachable? Okay, so I think there are a lot of areas that we can say are teachable, but a lot of um, areas that are really impactful fall under the how we investigate force, how we investigate complaints of misconduct and internal affairs, but really key areas include areas of training and not only what we train, how we train, but who we select to train our new officers or our new recruits that come in, so our field training program. You know, I tell my son, well. hey, if you get stopped by the police, this is what you do as well. You know, we have these seminars and these symposiums, but this is the reality. So I have a different uh, Someone else who was very supportive of this, of this, uh, this summit, very supportive of the Black Chamber of Arizona, uh, and a huge supporter of the city of Phoenix, our mayor, Greg Stanton. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Kermit, for that kind uh, introduction. Thank you to uh, Alan Powell, the Checker Flag Foundation, for helping to organize this very, very important uh, event. You're going to hear from some great speakers, but most importantly, we're going to have an outstanding dialogue, a very important dialogue today, but the beginning of, uh, of a dialogue on some of the most important issues facing us here in the United States of America. Your comments um, at the summit just were really teachable. I mean, I, you could hear a pin drop when you talked about teaching de-escalation and that it is more important to prevent a crime. So how do we teach this new generation of students um, about that kind of policing, that it is, although it's important to understand how to train with a weapon, but this is even more important, yeah. using your head. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I mean, uh, and, and I had mentioned something about how policing has changed, but the police haven't changed. Uh, and, and by that, what it really means is that demands that the community expect from the police department, uh, they raise the bar of what they expect from us. And, and many of us, and many officers, and many agencies across the country, hasn't really raised the bar to the level of the expectation of the community. And and, and part I, of that I is am of a philosophy a that just right? because it's legal doesn't make it necessary. And I have often said one of the I think one of the greatest disconnections that we have as police departments across the country is that that attitude of legality versus legality versus uh, necessity. This will help us in the future. Um, communication is the key. Communicating with the community and getting information from you on how we do our job. We are public servants. We want your input, we listen to your input, and we want to move forward with your ideas and your initiatives as well. So from a Phoenix Police Department uh, perspective, I believe it all starts with structure and communication. So structure, how is the organization laid out? Well, your Phoenix Police Department has a community services division. Everything in that division, and actually is supervised by Assistant Chief Mike Kurtenbach, who's in the back, and Matt Giordano is the a commander in that division. Everything community services related is in that division. It allows us greater focus, it allows us greater internal communication and external communication. This is a call to action. I spent my life in uniform, where the intellectual has to precede the physical. Hey boss, what do you want to try to accomplish? What, draw a picture, draw a mental picture of what right looks like. Do that for me, and guess what? The imaginative juices in this organization and in this room today, we're gonna to fill in the blanks. We're gonna figure this out. So it's not only a discussion. So this is the effort to get at the intellectual, you know, how because we, we have uh, a call to action. Guardians and not so much warriors, and I know you focused on that a lot. Um, that's a change in ideology that many uh, people in the community are not used to. We're used to officers with a gun and firing before talking. That's now what these students are going to be used to after watching the news or YouTube or something like that. Right. How do we begin to change that philosophy and, and how we teach them what a true police officer is? Well, you're still going to have police officers with guns. It's just a, a tool of our profession, uh, but that guardian uh, instead of warrior's mentality really breaks down to respect, uh, respect for your community, 
uh, respect for yourselves as police officers and the job that you have sworn to do uh, for that community and making sure that your interactions out there day in and day out are respectful to the community. So we specifically hired liaisons to work with the East African community, with uh, the Asian community, um, with the Norwegian community that all make up the city of Seattle. The sole intent there was, and, and you heard um, CJ say that a few minutes ago, and that was to have those conversations and to continuously engage uh, the community on what they expected from their police. Say for instance, if you have a really good recruiter and background investigator, they're gonna look at how many jobs the person may have been on, say in the last two or three years. A person who has jumped from one job to the next job, you know, after three months or after five months, that might send up a red flag to say, well, maybe this person isn't exactly sure what they want to do. That might be a question for our staff psychologist once they get to that point in the background process, for the staff psychologist who will do an interview to interview the candidate. From urban settings, you know, so needs to be dealt with and put squarely on the table is the fact that, that a lot of young officers have never been exposed to the urban setting when they become police officers. You know, they don't they haven't been to school with people from urban settings. And really getting into those communities and knowing who they're working with and not make the assumption from a community that may have been 80% African American before that is now 20% African American and 60% something else, that what that particular um, relationship was during the time of the 80% is still what is going on there now. And we, so they approach with old, old facts, old stats, so they need to, to really deal with that. So I think that first one, what I have learned over the 20 years, communities have seriously changed. Policing has not. I agree with you. When I say policing has changed, that really means our responsibility to the community and how we provide that service to the community. Uh, uh, that has changed, which means, I guess, being consistent with what you're saying, the community needs and their desires and their demands of us have changed, but we haven't changed. So, uh, basically, I, I agree with you, and just maybe it's just a semantical sort of verbiage as it relates to uh, what the intent was behind that. <clears throat> Having those interactions with people who don't look like you, more, that's more important than anything else, but it's also those folks who don't have the same experiences as you. So that's dealing with the homeless, that's dealing with folks who have limited capacity, uh, mental capacity. Um, you know, there are a lot of ways to actually interact with the community, working with youth and a variety of youth programs. What we're looking for is your ability to relate to people over and above some of those hard skills. We can teach you to drive, we can teach you to shoot, but really what we need more than anything else is the interpersonal skills, the emotional intelligence to be able to understand your personal limitations, set those aside or overcome those and be able to interact with other people. Our goal today is to discuss best practices, to actually have a dialogue that will hopefully um, create some, uh, some information that all of these chiefs and everyone here can take back to the local communities and actually continue the dialogue. I think everyone here knows that um, I, what I believe is we're, we're in a bit of a crisis right now. And if we don't do something, if we don't get started with the dialogue, not pointing the fingers at each other, but actually having a dialogue on exactly what we can do to, um, to, to provide solutions, and not just one solution, because one solution is not going to cure anything, but provide solutions and continuing a dialogue, not only here, but throughout the country, then that, that, uh, that crisis will continue.